Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Mr. Martin Kaur, who heads the South Centre in Geneva and who is very well known to climate activists, WTO activists for the kind of work that he has done on the trade negotiations earlier, now in climate negotiations. Martin, good to have you back with us. Very good to be here. Martin, where do you think the WTO negotiations are going? The minute we had the development round, it seems that development is off the agenda and the negotiations are collapsing. Well, it's very clear that we will not be able to conclude uh, this Doha negotiations this year or next year because uh, the developed and developing countries now see things in a very different way. I think the developed countries led by the United States but also the European Union, they have given up uh, the pretense that this is something to do with development this round and they have made it not only a market access uh, round but market access for their goods and services whilst at the same time they are sheltering their own important uh, goods and this is something that is uh, very hard for the developing countries to take still they have they had agreed on some basic text uh, of December 2008 in which uh, the imbalances are, uh, are so greatly against the developing countries but even that was not acceptable to the United States now and they are making more and more demands, especially of India and China. Uh, and the demands really are to open up uh, important uh, industrial sectors, including chemicals and pharmaceutical drugs, to have uh, zero tariff in uh, these three sectors, industrial machinery, pharmaceutical drugs and chemicals, uh, and electronics. Plus, uh, further opening in agriculture and in many services sectors, including uh, financial services. So at this point, I think uh, correctly, uh, India has uh, taken the lead among the two, three developing countries who came under this pressure to say that uh, this is just not fair and we, we, just cannot, uh, we just cannot take this, you know, especially since India is hardly going to benefit at all. The demands that India has been making, particularly in services, you know, that uh, there will be stability in relation to their honouring, outsourcing for call centres and other services. Uh, the Indian demand that uh, Indian professionals will be able to enter the United States uh, more easily and with a certain number, this have, this have not been given. Of course, in India, a lot of people would have seen that trade-off as something as a trade-off between helping a certain section of the people who would benefit from services against those who are involved in agriculture and other activities. But leaving that issue out, even There's that's no not being <laughs> even that's not being accepted. Even that's not being accepted. Right. Yeah. But looking at the other picture that the first round of WTO, 10 years of WTO clearly showed that the countries which had benefited were really the Western economies. The developed countries are the ones who really had benefited. And this was supposed to redress that. So effectively, WTO still remains completely one-sided against the interest of the developing countries. It is one-sided. The developing countries tried to change it by putting forward 100 proposals on reforming the WTO. Uh, India took the lead. Ambassador Narayanan is the father of that. I think he's now in Hyderabad. And uh, that was supposed to be the centerpiece of this new round. But today, this whole thing has been cast aside and only the market access issues, you know, that uh, the big countries want to get into China, India and other developing countries has now become the major demand and the major theme. And we have been forced to take a very defensive uh, position. For example, India is one of the leaders of the group of 33 developing countries that have said that we need to protect ourselves and our farmers from import surges cheap imports coming in, overwhelming the livelihoods of the farmers. And that if this is going to happen in future, then you can raise your tariff above the bound rate in order to defend the farmers' uh, livelihoods. This proposal has been accepted in principle, but not in practice, because in practice there are so many conditions put for this special facility that uh, it is uh, almost useless. It can only protect a very small section of the agricultural imports if the way the US or the Western countries or European Union is arguing. Yeah, the, con the conditions for using it are so onerous that uh, you, you can hardly make use of it. 
not even for a narrow band of products. This is one of the issues which concerns both you and people like me who have been agitating on this for years, that effectively it's hit a whole range of life-saving drugs, particularly for those who most need it, those who cannot really afford high-cost drugs. That also has not been addressed in any significant way. Well, the Indian system, you might say, is the pride of the developing countries. You know, the Indian uh, Drugs Act of the 1970s that paved the way for you to have a thriving generic industry, uh, which was hampered by the TRIPS agreement. And only in 2005, you really had to implement it. And we are now seeing the suffering of that implementation because uh, many drug companies are so uncertain about whether they will be able to expand the number of drugs that they can produce because now they may need to have a compulsory license and so on. It is the right of India to have compulsory license. But at the same time, that may be challenged by you know, powerful countries. And the drug industry is not really knowing whether they will get the compulsory license, uh, may not want to factor in investments in the future for something that might not appear. So I think this is the predominant uh, uh, effect that has implications not only for India, it has implications for many countries in Africa, in Asia and so on, uh, in Latin America that depend on cheap and high quality generics uh, from India. My own country is Malaysia and the Malaysian government was the first to introduce a compulsory license. This was in 2004 and that compulsory license was to import uh, three HIV AIDS medicines from CIPLA, an Indian company from here. So in future, uh, we are not so sure whether these companies uh, will be producing the new drugs. Uh, what is even more worrying for those of us who are watching the situation in India is the purchase of uh, many Indian pharmaceutical drug companies by the multinational companies because uh, it sends an element of uncertainty. We don't know whether the new owners will continue uh, using these factories to produce low-cost, high-quality drugs for the developing countries. To really look at the larger picture, that health costs, whether it's the US, whether it's the European Union, are a significant section of what's called the welfare costs. And you look at the fact that the patented medicine, patented products, technologies are a major section of that. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a really a possibility of getting a north-south uh, movement across the board for actually weakening the patent regime in the world? I think so, because uh, even in the United States, there are many consumer groups and there are many people in the establishment too in the United States. Even the Democrats, uh, you know, who, who are controlling Senate. They have uh, taken the position that uh, you know, it is important to reduce the cost of healthcare and uh, that patents uh, not only drive up the cost of healthcare but also prevent other companies from doing uh, research. You know? And there is a movement already, even in the developed countries, that are saying that the patent uh, rights of the private you know, holders uh, have gone too far and that the consumer rights and the public rights have to reassert themselves. There is in fact already a North-South citizens movement on access to medicine that has been operating uh, quite effectively. Interestingly enough, in the trade negotiations you get from the North, from US particularly, the far more regressive positions coming in on the question of patents. Yes, because uh, you know, I think in terms of the balance of power and so on, the, the big companies still are able to have greater influence over the government than this underlying uh, force that is emerging. But uh, one very interesting thing is that the Obama administration, at least the Attorney General's office, themselves have uh, taken the position that uh, uh, you should not, the United States should not grant patents for genes, for human genes. Because this, of course, has been a very major uh, setback when the Supreme Court uh, made a decision that genes, uh, even naturally occurring genes, can be patented. So that's an important and important milestone in, in that sense, if that really goes through. 
and the courts don't come out with something else. Unfortunately, during the appeal, well, the, the courts actually ruled that you cannot pattern genes that are naturally occurring. But this has been overturned, so we don't know what will happen at the final court. Thank you, Martin. We'll come back to you on this issue as the thing scenes unfold. But as it appears, the WHO negotiations seem to be deadlocked and that doesn't seem that this round is really going anywhere. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you further on this. Thank you, Prabhya, and thank you, News Click.